stays here. All right. <coughs> Uh, the name of this story is Mrs. Richard's Butterscotch Carmen. Edith's eyes are wide and focused on something across the room. Her hands are out and attempting to float out ahead. She crests like a wave and leans. Legs rush into the void beneath her. She is in an excruciating hurry. I want to slow her down, put up all the breakable things, move my toddling daughter to another room. But I can't do any of that. I saw in those early days when I had just married Peter and I found myself in her blender for the first time that this is just how it's going to be. Soon I wanted to do wicked things to her, like rearranging the living room or reparking the minivan backwards. Peter is nowhere to be seen at these times. It's true that women may choose to be anything they like, but default settings are not part of this choice. My job as a mother is about default settings. When I was pregnant, I was a spaceship, unbreachable sphere of default. Then all those defaults became choices to negotiate with my disembarked passenger. If you have a nursing baby and a pair of gorgeous tits, the default is you are a human snack bar. As a 30-year-old man, Peter's default in the house he grew up in is to rummage through old stuff, have meals made for him, call up old friends and go see the old places. He does not understand the world outside his mesmerizing vortex. He thinks I'm being a pain in the ass. Edith, though, she sees my struggle. My choices are made in the intimate world of her house and her child. Her orbit looks as though it intersects Peter, but she blows right through him. Is Peter a particle or a wave? He's a cloud that becomes more probable when compatible particles are present. I thought I was a compatible particle, but I push him out of phase and I pass through, only to collide with Edith and her house. Shower knobs are not just reversed, and they don't just turn the wrong way, but they are reversed, and one turns the wrong way. I don't know which one, because the part of my brain that can know that is blown up. They are painted in red and blue house paint. They are located in the inside corner of the shower next to the bathroom door. How did this happen? Why? These are questions of a new person, damaging, victim-producing questions. There are more questions. Three separate liquor cabinets in the living and dining rooms. Each are jammed with shot glasses, highball glasses, wine glasses with cut designs. There is no liquor. Well, there are a couple bottles in the garage. One I saw was some kind of a novelty chocolate wine. And there was also a flask of brandy stashed in a picnic cooler we hauled out of the attic when we wanted to have a picnic. The whole works is a toddler death trap. Sally is fascinated and a little intimidated by the endless complexity and hasn't even noticed the unobstructed electrical outlets, which would normally be her first interest. It's the cats she wants the most and the fact that their litter boxes are both placed in the center of the active living room gives her 360 degree access to them and all they produce. Children's toys are kept in a bin next to the sofa. The living room, between the kitchen and the back door, feels like the safest place to be, but sitting is tricky. There is a highly personalized sofa chair in a primary TV washing position with access to end tables which hold remote controls and fingernail clippers. It is covered in a sheet, underneath which appear to be foam blocks that could separate and swallow my ass. The imprint left by the chair's owner is wide and deep, imparting an unwelcome sense of intimacy unintended by any party. The two cats are horrified by Sally and give her a wide berth. They are obese because they are given mint chip ice cream at 9.15 every night. This happens because Herschel eats midship at nine and saves some in the bowl for the cats, announcing the event like an imam in a minaret and presenting the bowl on the carpeted intersection of the kitchen and the living room. Cinnamon materializes instantly. He seems the heavier of the two, but it's hard to say since they are never seen at once. I've come to believe that when one cat is observed, the other exists as a diminishing probability. <laughs> much as my own sense of self diminishes as I am immersed in this rich gumbo of others' lives. Angelina is somewhere in the upstairs closet, eyes wide, listening to our movements and waiting for the chance she must eventually take to void herself in the box 
and steal a few bites before going back on the lamb. To enter a room where this creature hides and catch her unawares is to see the scream rendered in feline expression. If she is seen, it is a subject of conversation for the day. She can only trot frantically, her pendulous belly swinging side to side like a grocery bag hung from bicycle handlebars. It is tempting to give chase, to punish the ill spirit, drive it from the house, but this is not my house, and she is someone else's ill spirit. Majestic is the term applied to cinnamon by Herschel. One is obliged to bend the knees when lifting cinnamon. The experience is not majestic, and it is preferable that he walk. He is self-assured and friendly, giving Sally a greeting on the lawn. She pursues cinnamon across the house, behind couches. It is possible Sally ignores her own instincts regarding unwholesome places. But then again, Sally craps in her pets. Evading an 18-month-old primate is not a problem for house cats. So he takes her or leaves her as he sees fit. It's the loss of territory that rankles, and I expect there is cat urine in places not normally found this week. The smell will be startling at first, then it will blend into other funky smells and fade, as cat urine is designed to do when the statutes of limitations expire and the claims are not renewed. Once, during ice cream time, I found a jar of Mrs. Richard's butterscotch caramel in the door of the refrigerator. The jar was nearly full, and there was a little coupon tied to the rim with a flaccid elastic band. In impossibly small font, the coupon described an elaborate procedure by which one could get a dollar off the purchase of ice cream by filling it out and mailing it to Mrs. Richards' representatives in El Paso. I was entertaining the idea of taking Mrs. Richards up on this, just to see how far she was willing to go. I searched for an expiration date and read that 1985 would have been the last time I could have mailed it in. For the sake of readers in the distant future, this occurred in 2006, 21 years after the offer expired. It seemed like an ironclad deduction that this caramel sat in the side door of the refrigerator throughout Peter's entire high school career. It evaded his sister's eating disorder and Edith's midnight excursions. Generations of cats had passed through puberty, heartbreak, vacations, Christmases. The refrigerator fills and empties like a glacier growing and receding across ice ages. It's emptied and cleaned, but most of its contents are put back. No single person knows the age and status of everything in it. It took strangers' eyes to see the jar. It took the bad taste and base craving for sugar of a human snack bar to overcome its incompatibility with mint chip. It was delicious. I like my caramel firm, and this was a little firm. Truth be told, I could have had it firmer. No one tried to stop me from eating it, but it caught Peter's eye. For the first time since landing in this place for our Christmas vacation, he studied what I was doing. He stared strangely at the jar, as if I had reached up and removed a tile of the sky and held it in my hand. I pushed the spoon down into it and waved the jar around upside down like a bell. Wow, said Peter. <laughs> All right, for our next through letter,